Fun Ideas Productions presents the Fun Ideas Podcast. Hi, this is Mark Arnold, and welcome to Fun Ideas Podcast number 25. I completed my interviews with Johnny Harvey for his Ghost Empire documentary about Harvey Comics. I covered essentially the entire history of the company. Johnny admitted that he's using my Harvey Comics companion as a blueprint template of how the documentary will come out. If you want to keep up on the progress of the documentary, log on to StoryStreetProductions.com. I also finished the index for Alvin, the story of Ross Bagdasarian Sr., Liberty Records, Format Films, and The Alvin Show, so that is really nearing completion. The Kramer family has promised me that they will have their revisions done by June 1st for Friendly Ghosts, Little Devils, Giants, and Rich Kids, the art and creations of Warren Kramer. Our guest today has had a wide and varied career. He ran a movie theater. He's been a horror movie host on TV. He's published his own comic books under the banner of Shanda Fantasy Arts featuring Shanda the Panda. He's written scripts for Richie Rich and other Harvey comics. But his current gig is the writer for Chester Gould's long-running Dick Tracy comic strip, which will be celebrating its 90th anniversary in 2021. Here he is, Mike Curtis. Okay, so on the phone today, I have Mike Curtis, who is currently the writer for the Dick Tracy comic strip. How are you, Mike? I'm doing fine. And as I usually start off, I just say, tell us about yourself and how you became involved in writing Dick Tracy and all the other projects you've done over the years. Uh, hmm. <laughs> well, hmm. <laughs> Basically, all my life, I've wanted to work in comics, even when I was a little kid. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to grow up to do. But growing up in a, in a rural uh, community, you know, it's not, not like DC and Marvel have uh, offices in every rural community, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, I've done a lot of jobs beforehand. I was, I've been a newspaper man, both a reporter and an editor, and uh, uh, managed movie theaters for a long time and such as that. I've been in law enforcement and other things. And in the 1980s, I got into comics finally when Harvey Comics uh, decided to come back after they had uh, let go of all of their staff and they needed new talent in a hurry. Mm -hmm. But uh, got into comics that way. Uh, during most of this time, I wanted to do Dick Tracy, but at the same time, it was years before I realized how you would go about such a thing, even if it was possible. Right. But uh, about uh, about 25 years ago, I started my own comic book called Shanda the Panda, and we just came out with the 50th and last issue of Shanda mm. cool. to complete the cycle. Uh, during that time, I, I, I tried uh, getting with different artists to put together a package for Dick Tracy. It never seemed to work out. And finally, I met Joe Staten, and uh, uh, Joe is as big a big a buff on Dick Tracy as I am, probably much bigger actually. Hmm. But uh, Joe, uh, Joe wanted to do Dick Tracy, so uh, we put together a package, and we didn't get the job. Hmm. Then, then five years later, we did it again, and this time we did get the job. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we've been doing it uh, coming up nine years now. Wow. <laughs> So, yes, we will talk about uh, your involvement, but uh, let's go way back to the bin beginning here. And uh, so 2021, which is a couple years from now, but by the time this sees print or whatever, um, it'll be Dick Tracy's 90th anniversary. And uh, so could, could you tell me how Chester Gould, the creator of the strip, came about uh, creating the strip and how he ended up doing that strip for what, about 40 years? Mm -hmm. Thereabouts. Uh, the, the, almost the same pathway, basically. He wanted to be a cartoonist, and he tried dozens of ideas, many of which never made it to print, a few of which made it to print but didn't last long. Mm -hmm. And since he was in Chicago, he came up with the idea uh, that uh, I want to do a character that will put those GD people in their in their places because this was the era of Capone mm -hmm. and the St. Valentine's Day massacre and such as that. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
basically he came up with this character called Plain Clothes Tracy <laughs> and tried. And uh, Captain D Joe Patterson of the uh, New York Herald Tribune and, uh, no, no, wait a minute, Chicago Tribune, New York uh, News Syndicate, got uh, liked it and he s sent him a telegram and said, this has possibilities, I want to see you. So he, he got with him and he said, the only thing is lose the plane clothes. He said, they call cops Dick something. Call him Dick Tracy. Wow. <laughs> That's basically where it started at. Back in uh, around 1930, and then it uh, made, the, made the papers in 31. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I was kind of doing a little research on Wikipedia, that bastion of uh, accuracy that I always... <laughs> um, they actually say in there that the first trip was on October 4th, or October 14th, 1931. So which, which one's correct? Hmm. I'm not sure. I imagine what they're talking about is Dick Tracy's first appearance was in a Sunday supplement. Ah, okay. So pro probably the, uh, you probably got two different dates there, one for the daily, one for the Sunday. And the Sunday started first. I see. So I didn't know that. October okay. 4th, probably Sunday. Okay. All right, that makes sense, yeah, because I don't have any of the current hardback collections, but um, I noticed that it's like there is an inconsistency on the Internet, and I go, what is correct, you know, and it seems like, are they leaving out the one, or they should put in the one? I don't know, but then what you said makes sense. It would be both. <laughs> well, in, in the first Sunday, he's basically just helping out some police. Uh, he's a witness to something or other. Mm-hmm. And how was it, because you told me before we got on re recording here, it's like you said you've read all 90 years or close to 90 years of cases, as it were. And um, how were those early strips? I mean, what type of characters appeared back then? Because it's very different than what it became. Mostly they were based on the, the real criminals of the day, like uh, Legs Diamond and uh, Capone. And, well, his main villain was Big Boy, who was obviously Al Capone. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, so basically, for the first few years, Dick Tracy didn't have a whole lot of villains, and he didn't have three or four a year. He had, he just had com uh, continual combat with the, the same villains, and eventually, uh, as he got the hang of it, basically, <laughs> uh, Ghoul got uh, got other characters and other villains involved, and other crimes involved, because originally it was just against the gangs. And eventually he got into kidnapping and other things. Doesn't that sound friendly, family friendly and pleasant? <laughs> he got it. After a while, he got into kidnapping. Mm. <laughs> now, were the stories back then like short or long, or how how did they they work? I mean, they were all over the place because Chester was learning his craft. Remember? Okay. Almost everybody that was doing comic strips was learning their craft at the time, and they were learning on the job. Nowadays, you wouldn't have that privilege, but it was it's like a vaudeville where uh, they used to say you, you broke into show business in vaudeville because you could uh, hone your craft, see how long you could stretch a joke or how short you were going to have to make it, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Now, in those early years, were there any other, other not villains, but just regular characters like uh, Junior and Tess Trueheart, those type of people, were they in there at the beginning, or was that later on also? Tess Trueheart is in the very first comic strip. Oh, okay. <laughs> so she was there from the beginning. Uh, the premise was that uh, Tracy was a businessman of some, apparently a small businessman who'd had a lot of problems and uh, was dating Tess Trueheart and uh, visited her folks' house for dinner one night and uh, was telling them, you know, well, we're going we're to get married. And that's when uh, Emil Trueheart, who was uh, Tess's father, He'd taken home the night's receipts, and he kept them in the safe. And two guys broke in and uh, shot him, killed him, and got got the stuff out of the safe. And Tracy vowed that he would uh, he would hunt them down, and he got a break. And the the chief of uh, uh, police deputized him on the spot to help hunt down the criminals. So he started picking it up from there. Okay. And uh, you know the other characters, uh, is, is Sam Ketchum and people like that, do they just kind of evolved over the years, or were they, you know, how did they come into the strip? Pat Patton was the first uh, sidekick, and he was there until 1949, when uh, Chief Brandon retired after a bad incident. And it says, it's been retro that uh, 
Tracy was offered the chief position, but uh, passed on it, and Pat Pat took it, and that's when Stan Ketchum came in as the assistant. Ah, okay. And that would be nice. Since, since you've read all these, is there like a true continuity to all this, or did uh, Chester Gould kind of change things along the way so it kind of gets frustrating for longtime fans? Uh, it's a little loose on continuity at the start. Yeah. But uh, aside from that, it, it, it holds up fairly well. There's a, the, the continuity holds up fairly well. Okay. Then when did the villains start coming in that have the crazy names or like Flat Top and Prune Face and those types? That started uh, the uh, middle to late 30s, mm -hmm. because as late as 1935, he was still t tallying around with some of the early villains, breaking jail occasionally, and uh, Tracy going after them. Like uh, Steve the Tramp and Stooge Villar broke jail and teamed up and went on a long, long, th uh, long adventure. Mm -hmm. But uh, the 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 Ghoul Ghouls, as uh, they're also called, <laughs> uh, they started uh, late th 1930s because. Up to that point, like, uh, I think Boris and Zora Arson, a brother and sister team that were like Bonnie and Clyde, were one of the last of the uh, ones that were based on uh, real people. <coughs> mm -hmm. And uh, let's see here. I believe the blank was, the blank is pretty much known as the very first real uh, ghoulish villain okay. in the strip. And from there, it went. Uh, he went to Midget and Mama, and then it was weird villains from there on. <laughs> So the, you're, you're talking about the 39 to 40 okay. is when it uh, started uh, getting into uh, the trademark uh, Strange Villain. And I assume this was very popular with readers, otherwise he wouldn't have continued doing that, or is it just something he liked? No, it was very popular with readers. His, his, uh, his circulation increased a lot. Talk about the strip increased a lot at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, probably his peak year was 1944. And uh, you've got Flat Top, you've got The Brow, and you've got Shaky. You've got three of the best villains all in that one year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I know, like, Flat Top died at some point, and then there's Flat Top Jr. Did any of the other characters die? I don't remember that, you know, so because I don't know... I'm not as knowledgeable as you about this. So, I mean, is there uh, death or characters that just don't come back? Uh... Or does everybody come back just like Superman or something like that? <laughs> no, it's, it's normally, the, it's very rare for the villains to come back. That's an unusual thing. Okay. That's something, that's something uh, his uh, his uh, replacements through the years have done. Max Allen Collins and uh, Mike Killian and myself have done through the years. Is we've tried to bring some of the villains back, and it's not easy because usually uh, Chet would... Uh, Make, make doggone sure they were good and dead. <laughs> like, Flat Top could not be brought back because not only what did he drown, but he was pu shown being pulled out of the water. He was shown on the slab. Right. Then they showed him digging his grave. Then they showed his grave. Right. So it would be impossible to bring Flat Top back. It was all a dream. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, the typical thing. <laughs> we would never, never do that in Dick Tracy because <laughs> Tracy has got to be realistic. Yes. <laughs> We'll talk about the 60s in a bit, but anyway. Um, so, I, I guess, you know, the inevitable question is, what are your favorite villains? Because you said you're bringing them back uh, over the years. Uh, my favorite villain is Shaky, but I can't bring him back. Oh, that's too bad. He was a skeleton when he was shown last. So there's not, it's not possible. <laughs> is it... I, I don't want to bring him back a, a brother or a, a relative of his. Hmm. It, it, it just wouldn't be the same. Shaky, Shaky was just a one of a kind. Now, Flat Top, we, uh, Ghoul brought back Flat Top in a way with Flat Top Jr. Right. Max Allen Collins brought back Angel Top, who was Flat Top's daughter. And later on did High Top, who was Flat Top's grandson, who we ignore. <laughs> because that's basically way too old to be fighting crime. We did have Mrs. Flat Top for some time. Hmm. And that, that was kind of fun. Now, could you ever write something like this? I mean, obviously you could write anything if you want to, since you're the writer, but would you ever do for Shaky, like, 
you know, a mi like a flashback that never happened, but you could set it in the time and frame before the character died or anything like that. We did a we did a origin story one time on Dick Tracy because usually if somebody kills your relative, the t chief of police doesn't deputize you <laughs> to go after them. So we uh, did a we did an origin story where Tracy was a a, re a regular beat cop and he was trying to get into the detective thing. And then the regular origin takes place. But uh, during that time period, we showed all, all the villains that were dead now. Mm. We showed them alive and working around. And well, I got to show Shaky for a couple of panels. Mm -hmm. That's cool. <laughs> so, yes, we actually did that. We, we did a flashback okay. where we showed that. Very good. And um, during the 30s and 40s, what do you consider high points of the strip in those uh, early to mid years? Well, you have to remember, and Chester Gould wouldn't tell you, too, that uh, he was competing with the headlines, and the headlines were D-Day and uh, the ba Battle of the Bulge and things like that go happening. So 1944, when D-Day happened, you've got Flat Top going at it with Dick Tracy. So, uh, yeah, basically he really had to fight, especially in the war years, to get att people's uh, attention off the front page and onto the comics page. Hmm. Okay. And um, let's see, about that time in the 40s, I guess, is uh, uh, was the introduction, you can confirm this, uh, the two-way wrist radio and other little gadgets that started coming in the strip. What what was kind of the origin of that and why? Why? Yeah. Well, it was... Uh, it was a, a thing thrown into a, a story that was already going on involving a B.O. Plenty, who was on the run, because at the time he was a villain. Mm -hmm. And uh, he finds this weird little radio gadget, and it turns out that Diet Smith has been working on this, this two-way wrist radio. And uh, after the adventure is over and he's, his life has been saved, he donates the two-way wrist radio to the uh, police department. That was around 40... Mm, Seven or eight, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's where that came in. And that, that's where uh, Chet Gould started getting the reputation for being futuristic. Hmm. I mean, there had been some weird science occasionally in the strip, but it wasn't anything that was real or anything. And this was an actual possibility, a right. two-way wrist radio. And it was something a lot of cops would have loved to have at the time. Right. Of course, cop, of course cops have the equivalent of that nowadays. Right. So it doesn't, it, I can go out and buy the equivalent of it nowadays. Now, did Chester Gould realize he was doing that, or was it just like, oh, I need a plot device here? He, real, he realized he was being a, being a futurist at the time, yes. Okay. Yeah, he, he knew he was uh, changing things. And he tried uh, with other things. Uh, he tried a ring camera that didn't catch on. Oh. <laughs> he tried uh, uh, different... Uh, things with television that didn't catch on but nothing nothing made the impression of the two-way wrist radio which later became a two-way uh, wrist tv mm -hmm. and eventually became a wrist computer a wrist genie and now we have something called a wrist wizard yeah that's, what, that's my next question i know it evolved to the tv i didn't know if it got modernized beyond that so yeah <laughs> i was just curious about that so um now, have you come up with any additional inventions uh, in your tenure of the strip, or did any of the other people post uh, uh, Chester Gould come up with any sort of inventions that are still used today, or is that kind of lost on the Gould years or stuck with him? Well, I mean, uh, we still use the two-way. Uh, right. We use the two-way wrist wizard, and uh, but we've given it uh, things. We've given it new features, like for instance, uh, it can uh, project pictures. You know, rather than you have to squint into a little bitty thing, you can project it on a wall and look at a look at reports or other things with it. Mm. <laughs> and you can communicate back and forth by uh, and this like a like a video telephone type of thing mm. or a Skype. Yeah. Skype is the best way, I guess, to put it. <laughs> it has Skype function. Two way Skype, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. And uh, let's see, another thing that kind of came out, you can tell me when it started. I remember reading the strips. I started reading them in the early 70s, and typically on Sundays. I never really read the daily ones much, but they always had the Crime Stoppers textbook. What was kind of like the origin of that feature? Uh, the 
Crime Stoppers textbook came out of a, a storyline where uh, Junior was the main character, and he had a bunch of kids uh, in a gang with him, and they were fighting crime in their neighborhoods type of thing. Mm -hmm. There were these older teenagers that were busting into uh, telephones and uh, candy machines and other things, juvenile crime type of thing, and uh, they called themselves the Crime Stoppers. And uh, somebody wrote Chester Gould and said, that's a good idea, you ought to have a club like that. So he came up with that. So that was a, a gimmick in the strip for a while. But the little Crime Stoppers panel that, that's at the top of the strip, that, that came out about that time because the way the strip was formatted, there had to be something up there, and he decided the Crime Stoppers would work just fine. Hmm. We still have the Crime Stoppers, but we alternate it hmm. with uh, Dick Tracy's role of honor or Dick Tracy's... Uh, uh, basically, uh, saluting uh, real, real first responders. Right. Yeah. I know you have like uh, I'm jumping ahead on the story, but yeah, I know you have like the tr uh, Tracy's Hall of Fame. Is that what you were referring to, or is that a different feature? That's a that's a that's a feature I couldn't remember the name of it for a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, Tracy's uh, Roll of Honor, which is for deceased uh, first responders mm -hmm. and such. Mm -hmm. uh, we we salute real real people that really do this work that way. So that's now the thing. Go ahead. I don't write that. Lieutenant Walter Reimer does our Crime Stoppers for us. Oh, that's he does, cool. Yeah, he does the hints, the Roll of Honor, and the Hall of Fame. Hmm, that's very good. So that feature, yeah. And uh, that's just on the top of the Sundays, like it's always been. Yes. Okay, got it. It's okay. been on top of Sundays since. Uh, about 1949. Oh, wow. Okay. Because <laughs> I know even my mom used to say, because my mom would, and dad both read Dick Tracy as kids, and my mom says, I used to clip them and put them in a little scrapbook and things like that. It was like, that oh. was the idea. That was what they were there for. Yeah. Was for people to clip and put in a little scrapbook. Yeah. And she did. Unfortunately, she didn't keep them, but, you know, hey, now that they're being reprinted, it's okay. So you can go back and look at all of them. But, um,. So how did the strip kind of evolve from the 30s and 40s into, like, the 50s and 60s? I've heard, like, various opinions about, like, maybe not the 50s, but more the 60s of it just kind of getting really weird and going into space adventures and stuff like that. And in fact, a lot of people just dismiss those years as just being not... Uh, I mean, even going so far as saying it's non-canonical or something like that. Uh, what is your take on that? Well, our take on it is is if Chester Gould wrote it, it's canon. Okay. That's, ba that's basically the way we, we look at it. So we uh, we do storylines with characters from those days, such as Moon Maid. We brought back, back Moon Maid, for instance. Mm-hmm. Now, how, how was the public's uh, reception to it at the time? I mean, now it's kind of laughingly dismissed somewhat, I've heard, you know. It's like, but, I mean, was it uh, positive reception, or was uh, Dick Tracy kind of losing popularity in those years? What was going on? Are you talking about when we brought it back or when it was there? No, in the 50s and 60s. That's what we're, we're talking about. Okay, it was very popular. Uh, Moon Maid was a very popular character, and uh, Chet Gould basically looked on Moon Maid as just a natural progression just like the uh, two-way wrist radio, mm -hmm. that uh, cops would be eventually fighting crime on the moon. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the reasons he did Moon Maid, and I, uh, let's put this in here, is uh, one of his favorite TV shows was a new show that came out in 62 called The Jetsons. Yeah. He liked that quite a bit, and he, he came up with, he decided he wanted to be futuristic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you said that, I, it, first before you said Jetsons, I was saying he probably liked My Favorite Martian, but <laughs> I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But uh, So what, what's kind of Moon Maid's uh, history? I mean, how did that? what was the storyline there? I really have not read those. So, I mean, just a little brief recap on her. Okay. Basically, he had already come up with Diet Smith, and Diet Smith had this thing called a space coop, which could fly all over the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that that was just a nat natural outgrowth growth of uh, Tracy's gadgets and such. But anyway, he decided uh, he had shown that uh, the space could, could even go to the moon. So he decided...
decided to, that they found somebody. They got a stowaway up, up on the moon, and that was a uh, moon mate. Hmm. <laughs> she, just, uh, she stowed away in the space coop while they were up there. Hmm. And uh, anyway, that she was one, uh, probably the main character during the 60s. Mm-hmm. Now, are there any uh, other uh, moon characters, or is it just her? I, you know, like I said, I'm not familiar with this, because a lot of the Tracy books I've read, which are more of the compilation ones, they don't really cover those years, so... <laughs> You know, it's like I know that uh, Dick Tracy spun off into a lot of different things and of varying success, but let's kind of talk about them. So I know, I think the first thing it spun off into was a radio show. Is that correct? Uh, let's see. Yep. The radio show would be first, followed by the movie serials. Okay. And, uh,. Do you think the I've seen the movie serials, but it's like I haven't really listened to the radio show. Do you think that the radio show was authentic or true to the strip, or did they kind of go their own way with it, like some of the other adaptations? Uh, they did various radio shows of Dick Tracy. Mm -hmm. Some of them were very, very much uh, with the strip, and some of them weren't. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd you'd have to say that basically. Uh, it would depend on which radio sh version of Dick Tracy you were talking about. Okay, so it was never like a, a single series that lasted for a long time, so it was just for... No, there wasn't. Oh, okay. So it never achieved the same popularity as, say, like a Bud Call, you're doing Superman or something. Were there different actors playing Dick Tracy each time, too? Uh, mostly, pretty much. Okay, so it never uh, really caught on on the radio as as well as other things. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they had serialized adventures. They had uh, done in one day adventures and such as that. The uh, when they were doing it all in one day, they used a lot of the characters such as uh, such as a flat top and uh, some of the other characters, some of the other villains from the strip. Right. And did they respect the continuity? It seems like they always had flat top in there, even if he died in the strip. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, he, and he, he's he's a great character. It's just like. Uh, Sherlock Holmes only met Moriarty once, but almost every movie version has Moriarty in it. Right. <laughs> You're correct on that. That's funny. Um, and then, uh, let's see, the movie serials. The movie serials for me, and, you know, I guess, are they considered short movies like Dick Tracy versus Cue Ball, or are those considered serials? But, but it seems like they always had villains that weren't in the strip at all, unless I'm incorrect about that. Is that true? You're, you're you're entirely correct there. Um, uh, the serials they had uh, strip-like villains in them and in the uh, four RKO features, mm -hmm. but uh, they did not adapt any of the villains from the comic strip in, on film until the TV series of the 1950s. And why was that? Was it licensing, or is it just they wanted to go their own direction, or probably just wanted to go their own direction, and probably really probably really didn't want to fool with the makeup hmm. for, for these characters. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, you know, because I know uh, Boris Karloff's in one, and he basically looks like Boris Kar Karloff. He doesn't have anything uh, really distinctive, uh, like a Frankenstein monster makeup or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, do you think those were pretty successful, or were they kind of dismissed? I mean, or even now, do, do people respect those films, or do they... Uh, just kind of dismiss it as uh, that's not like Dick Tracy. Um, the serials were very successful because they made four of them after all. Mm -hmm. They didn't make four of Flash Gordon. You know. Right. That, that, that uh, I think the only other character that had four serials or more was uh, Zorro. Hmm. And you've got different Zorros then. Right. 
I didn't even realize they had made so many serials on Cesaro. Um, and I didn't even think about that Dick Tracy had more, you know, because I'm thinking, well, yeah, Batman, I think, had two, and uh, Superman, was it two also or three? I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Dude, they talked about a third. Yeah. So, um... And then moving on, you mentioned the TV show. So, um, how was the TV show? I don't think I've ever seen the TV series. So, was that a single series, or is it again like the radio show, as many attempts at doing a TV series? Basically, the TV show was actually quite good for its time, although produced quickly and inexpensively. Mm-hmm. They brought back Ralph Bird, who had done, who had played Dick Tracy in all four serials plus two feature films. Oh, okay. And uh, you can see it on YouTube. Some of the episodes are lost, unfortunately. Hmm. So the entire series does not exist. But you can look up, up about, uh, there's, I think there's about 10 or 12 episodes on YouTube. Hmm. And they use the strip villains in, in the uh, TV series. Oh, okay. Except they didn't go to great trouble with makeup and such. They just have a character actor that would suggest the character. And they might have him... Uh, they might have one of them trembling a little bit, and somebody says, calm down, shaky, and that's as much as you got. On that <laughs> so it's just name only, and it's like he's just standing there still. And the, name only. Yeah. <laughs> now, prune face has the smoothest face. I know. <laughs> um, the prune face is lost. He's one of the lost ones. I don't know what they did with him. Hmm. We've seen the, the mole had a four-parter, uh-huh. and at one point he took on a character named the Joker, Mm-hmm. Is, is and, there uh, is there a reason why this series is lost? I mean, who produced it, or is it just like in a vault somewhere? It would be nice if it ever turned up in a vault. Uh, basically, collectors have been turning up episodes through the years. Okay. So, About uh, four or five episodes have been found over the last year, so eventually we may see Prune Face. Oh, okay. The flat top one. Uh, the flat top episode is uh, rather laughable, actually. <laughs> Uh, because uh, you know uh, Donald Duck wears a kind of a cap right and that's, it's kind of a beret or something I don't know what you'd call it it's kind of like a beret mm-hmm. well in, in the flat top episode you've got this very tough guy and he's good at playing flat top and he's wearing one of these caps but he's got it flat on his head <laughs> or it looks like he's got a little table on top of his head <laughs> that's why it's flat <laughs> I'll have to check that out. You said that one's on YouTube too. <laughs> yes. Okay. Check it out. I mean, it's it's rather funny because you've got this really tough guy, and you can go walk by and put a glass on top of his head. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the new villain, Tablehead. Yes. <laughs> Tablehead. Yeah. yeah, Tablehead probably would have been a better name for the villain in that movie. Or that movie. But they would have done more than one season. But Ralph Bird died. He had a heart attack. Okay. And he had, uh, basically, he was in his mid-40s, so he could have done Dick Tracy for many years. And that's probably why the uh, series has pretty much gone into into, into the Phantom Zone, because uh, it, it got showed a long time ago, and uh, there weren't a whole lot of episodes for you to sign up for. There were only like 30 episodes, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, now are there any, like... Even if there are any DVD compilations or anything that you found or anything like that? Uh, it's public domain, so occasionally it shows up on DVD in the stores and such. Got it. You know, a, a, your spinner rack at the Dollar General store type of thing, you know. Right, right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and um, let's see. Uh, I understand. I think I've seen it before. Didn't... Uh, I forget the name. Is it Dozier? William Dozier, the guy who produced the Batman series with Adam West. Didn't he make an attempt to do a Dick Tracy series and it didn't sell? He did. That's on YouTube as well. Okay. And now, wh- they had planned to have the strip villains on there. There's not a strip villain in the pilot that's on YouTube. But a makeup test exists for a prune face and flat top. And there are photos that you can look up on the internet. Lon Chaney Jr. playing Prune Face, for wow. instance. <laughs> but it might have been pretty interesting if it, if it had ever gone that far. Right. 
and do do you know why it didn't succeed is it because maybe green hornet didn't succeed as well as batman or it just all those shows kind of ran their course or what um they said that the broadway musical of superman didn't succeed because of what they call batlash mm. you know the, the public was saturated with batman and uh, that was too much superhero for uh, most people <laughs> and uh, it could be bad actually plus you know, uh, the, the, the Dick Tracy TV show, it, it handles up well unless you're comparing it to Batman or other things. Right. And they only did the pilot, right? They didn't They didn't actually film any episodes, right? No, just the pilot. Okay. And have there been any other TV attempts? I'm not talking about cartoons, but, I mean, a live-action attempts since, or is that the last one that was tried? The Beatty movie. What was that? Sorry? The Warren Beatty movie. Oh yeah, but that was a theatrical. I mean, TV series. No, no, I would, I would wish they had. I mean, uh, Tracy was in two cartoons on TV. Right. Uh, there was the early 1960s uh, series where he gave out assignments to people like Joe Jitsu and such as that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Archie character had a a, a, a variation one uh, season called Archie's TV Funnies, and they did. Uh, cartoons of Ali Oop and the Nancy and Sluggo and Dick Tracy, quite a few Dick Tracy ones, which are not bad, but they're extremely nonviolent. Right. <laughs> I remember those. I mean, extremely nonviolent. Yes. <laughs> and you couldn't use a fly spotter in these things. <laughs> and uh, what they did, since uh, Tracy was so science fiction-y at the time, was Tracy and company and the villains all used different rays. My freeze ray will stop them, or my this ray will stop them, and using ray guns and things like that. Mm -hmm. and so, they're, they're not they're not very uh, indicative of the comic strip, per se. Yeah. And on the cartoon adaptation, since we're talking about those now, um, again, you know, it's like, uh, well, they use some of the villains, but I mean, uh, do you know I mean, I'm I'm pretty knowledgeable about UPA's history, but I really don't know why would they get those other characters like Joe Jitsu and uh, Go Go Gomez and you know was it just to give some variety to it? Because I mean, there's enough characters in the regular Dick Tracy strips that they didn't need to create more. Is that just UPA's claim on it so they could merchandise or something? What is your take on that? that that's a mystery. <laughs> I wish I did. I wish I actually knew the answer to that one. Okay. I, I mean, I could see them going with uh, the Retouchables, which was a bunch of cops. Right. That was one of the characters, and or Hebo Calvary. But at the same time, Joe Jitsu and uh, Go Go Gomez and such as that. It's just, uh, I guess they figured kids would like those characters better than they would uh, <laughs> old uh, Vice John Dick Tracy. Yeah. Because that, to be honest, that was my first exposure to Dick Tracy, is those in reruns on on TV, and then and then I saw the strip in the newspaper, and I said, "Well, Dick Tracy's here, but where are all those other characters? This is nothing like." <laughs> and it kind of confused me when I was a little kid. You know, we're talking early '70s, and then later I figured it out. I go, "Oh, okay, that was this, and this is this," but. Um, uh, what I noticed about that, and even the later Archie one, is Dick Tracy doesn't really do much in it. It's like it's almost like why did they bother to even do a Dick Tracy series? You know, just to have the other characters. I don't know. Yeah, uh, well, in his own in his own strip, Tracy is very much a reactive character. Okay. Someone has to do a crime or something before much happens with Dick Tracy before he really gets into action. So he's he was always written as a reactive character. Right, but he never, well, unless I'm wrong, but, you know, in the strip at the time, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you know, he wasn't, uh, like, calling it in, just going on his wrist radio and saying, hey, go out there and get these guys while I sit back and eat a sandwich in the office, because <laughs> that's what it always seemed like on the UPA cartoons, <laughs> and then he'd come back at yeah. the end and say, good job, you know, and it's like he didn't do anything, what was that? <laughs> Well, the thing is, I don't know if you know it or not, those things are still shown on uh, some religious channels, primarily as filler. Right. Because they, they don't want to advertise them because uh, Joe Jitsu and Go Go Gomez are very non-PC. Right. Well, 
for me, I did get the DV, the DVD set. And d- didn't you contribute something to that, like a little booklet to that DVD set, if I remember correctly? Nope, you remember wrongly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not me. Oh, okay. Maybe it was the Dick Tracy booklet, but maybe it was done by a different publisher or something like that. I thought you were associated with that one. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. And then, well, you mentioned the Dick, the Warren Beatty movie. I mean. What is your opinion about it? Some people say it's good. Some people hate it. You know, some people like the the attempt and the colors. What is your take on that movie? For legal reasons, I am prohibited from answering that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, since I'm not under any obliga- obligations, I thought it was interesting, but a, kind of a a misfire of what they could have done, and I. I uh, unfortunately, it's like it just seems like that's like the last nail in the coffin of any other adaptation, unless somebody else wants to just take it up, which is kind of too bad because I know Disney at the time put a lot of money and uh, emphasis behind it. They were going to do a lot of Dick Tracy rides and everything else, and sequels and everything else. Um, uh, what do you think happened? I mean, is Dick Tracy out of favor so much by the 80s and 90s, or um, what's your take on that? Well, I know what happened, but for legal reasons, I'm prohibited from answering that. Oh, okay. All right, all right. I won't go into that. Okay, that's fine. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So, um, other things that they attempted over the years, you know, of course, there's comic books. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, um, who was the first publisher? I know Harvey published later on, but who was the first uh, publisher on the Dick Tracy comics? That would be Dale. Okay. And were they doing new adventures or just reprints from the uh, the strip? Reprints. Okay. Reprints only. And did they ever do new stories in the comics, or is that just uh, always reprints? I, I don't remember. I think the Harvey ones are generally reprints, though. The Harvey ones were generally reprints, except they had uh, sometimes one and two page of fillers with Dick Tracy that was new material. Okay. And did you know who did those? Uh, I presume Joe Simon and my old mentor, uh, editor, uh, Ken Stelic. Oh, okay. But I, beyond that, I don't know. Well, I know Simon did a lot of the covers of those issues, so, you know. Even... There's, there's no credits on those, and there's nobody left to ask, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so, and um, let's see. Do, 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 do. You've even done some comic books recently. I think I received one from uh, your inker, Shelley Plager. Um, how did those come about? Oh, oh, okay. Those. Well, we wanted something in print. Mm-hmm. So Joe and I decided to get together, and uh, through Shanda Fantasy Arts, uh, we come out with one of those a year. We uh, reprint a story and we give it away free at, at convention appearances. Oh, okay. We've got we've got one in preparation right now. Is that just and, for uh, conventions, or is that for free comic book day, or both? Uh, both if if we're if we happen to be close to a comic book store and can talk to them about it. Oh, got it. Okay. But primarily, it's just for conventions. Got it. Okay. Because I've gotten a few of those, thank you, but it's through Shelly, so it's like I don't think I've ever talked to you about it, but yes, I've gotten a couple of them through her. So, <laughs> Well, uh, the one we're working on right now is a reprint of the adventures that we did with the Spirit, mm-hmm. and uh, we decided that would probably be the best one and that uh, the one people most people would uh, go after. Now, is, is J- when that, that one came out, was Joe drawing it, or was it... Uh, uh, did you have another yeah. artist guest on that one? That was Joe. So he did the whole thing. Okay. So I have not seen those. So, <laughs> but once the book came, once the comic comes out, I guess I will. <laughs> the spirit one has not gone to press yet. It's in preparation. Got it. Okay. And so going back to into the seventies, uh, did Chester Gould? have any health problems? I mean, I know he, he died later on, but I mean, is like, uh, what what prompted his decision to kind of retreat from the strip and then eventually retire by 77? What was uh, what was going on with his life there? Well, uh, leaning over a drawing board, basically he had back problems from doing that for 40 or 50 years. And uh, he just wanted to have some time to 
enjoy life some. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't read a lot of those later strips uh, before we retired. Did the strip kind of go out with a bang, like he had a like a big giant uh, climax or something like that, or did it just kind of go out with a whimper and then the next day it was Max Allen Collins and Rick Fletcher? It kind of went out with a whimper because, uh, in fact, uh, when he did the Sunday strip, he wasn't aware that that was going to be his last Sunday strip. Oh, wow. Okay. So it kind of went out with a whimper. Hmm. Okay. Was that intentional or was that just by accident, do you think? Mainly by accident. It's just uh, the, the, the dates and such within specified in contracts and other things. Okay. You know. And I, I know Collins and Fletcher worked with Gould, but were he were they his direct successor choice, or was that more the syndicate saying you're gonna, you're doing it now? The syndicate decided who would uh, who would uh, write and draw the strip. They hired Collins specifically to write it. Mm -hmm. Fletcher was uh, Gould's assistant, and uh, they got, picked him to carry on the art. Okay. And. Um, I assume, did, did Max Cowell and Collins have, like, extensive knowledge like you do of the strip? Is that why they picked him? What was the reason why they picked him? Well, they, they wanted a mystery writer, and he was known for that, but it was a happy accident that he had extensive knowledge of the strip. Okay. So they, they, well, per, was, they pursued him, or did he pursue the strip? Oh, they pursued him. Oh, okay. And then he, he did it for quite a long time. How long did he do it? He, he did it into the 90s, didn't he, or is that correct? Uh, I think he did it about 11 years or so. Okay. Most of the 90s, but I don't think he was in the 90s. Okay. And but uh, Mike Killian was the next writer, but by that time, Rick Fletcher had passed away, right. and Dick Loker came back. He had been an assistant in the late 50s. And he came back to draw the strip. So, how many how many assistants did Chester Gold have? Do you know all of them? I mean, I know a few of them, but I don't know all of them. Okay, and you're talking about over a thirty thirty six year period. Or okay, so. so he had assistants pretty much from the start. Yes, and of course he started off as an assistant. He used to be an assistant on uh, on Gas Alley for one thing. Oh, that's right. I did read that. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, it's kind of funny when you look at comic strips, you always think everybody did, at least me, you know, when I was younger, you think, oh, everybody does it like Charles Schultz. They do it all themselves for their whole career. And then you find out later, it's like, wow, everybody had assistants. It's like Charles Schultz was just unique. <laughs> well, like, for instance, uh, Al Cap, his assistant did it for uh, about 20, 25 years. And then he started uh, getting work from Warren doing covers, and that was Frank Rosetta. Yes. <laughs> And you could definitely tell, you know, Frazetta's art style is, like, really evident in the, a lot of those ones. You know, maybe not initially, but definitely later on. And it's like, wow, this does not look like Al Cap's stuff anymore. You know. Um, let's see. And then, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. so uh, we said Rick Fletcher passed away. Dick Loker came over. Uh, John Loker was his son, or who was that? He he also did art. That was his son. Okay. That was his son, yes. And did they work on it at the same time, or just Dick uh, retired and then John came and what's the story there? Bri briefly, John was slated to take over the strip, but John passed away. Oh, okay. So, and then... I think briefly I read that, uh, and I don't even know who this person is, so you can tell me, Jim Brosman did the art very briefly? Uh, yes, toward the end of Dick Loker's uh, time. Okay. And Killian was writing all the way to the end before you and uh, Joe took over, is that correct? No, oh, he died five years before we took over. Oh, okay. Then Dick and drew it both. Oh, okay, got it. Hmm. So... That brings us up to roughly, I guess, 2010, right? Uh, so how, how, how did it get to the point? You said you approached them or they approached you. What was the story again of how you got involved with the strip? We were doing some uh, fan art of uh, Dick Tracy online, and they approached us. Oh, okay. 
because I, I know talking with you a long time ago, you know, long before you ever did it, you know, I knew you were a Dick Tracy fan, you know, and you talked about your collection and things like that. I know you're a Superman and Harvey fan too, but, you know, it's like, um, but, uh, you know, so th they just knew from that, they said, these are the guys. I mean, it's like, it, it, I, I guess the strip was lucrative enough even at that point to continue it. Um, yes. Okay. Because it, it, it always seems to me like, well, well, these guys keep passing away. And maybe we should just retire the strip and be done with it, you know, which seems to happen with some other strips. And then they just kind of are in reprints forever, you know. I don't know. Yeah, that, that happened with Brenda Starr and that happened with Little Orphan Annie. Right, right. And, um, but uh, I think since you've taken over, I mean, I, I think it's a very, uh, handsome looking strip the way it works now i like the art i like the writing and i like it that you brought back certain characters and things like that um uh has it been reflected in the public eye where they say wow we like this or uh, you know what's how, how's it uh perceived today as a as a strip we get a lot of good notice and good feedback and uh, mentions on different websites and in newspaper articles and such as that Plus, we've won three Harvey Awards for our Outstanding Comic Strip. Oh, wow. Okay. We won three years in a row at the Harveys. Got it. Okay. And um, t I, I, know I mentioned Shelly, and then you have Jim Doherty doing the color. Is that all the people working on the strip now, you, Joe, Jim, and Shelly, or is there other people that help assist you with the strip nowadays? Okay. I write it, Joe draws it, Shelly inks and letters, and also does a script doctoring on it. Mm -hmm. Shane Fisher does the Sunday colors. Ah. Uh, Walt Reimer is our police advisor. Jim has retired. Ah, okay. Cause, so I'm not up to date on my on my information. All right. So, and um, how do you do you scout out these people? I know you've known Shelley way back, but uh, uh, is, are you allowed to pick your colorist or whatever, or is it just given to you by yeah. the syndicate? Yeah, we're, get, we're given a lot of freedom by the syndicate. We like that quite a bit. Okay. Yeah, that was my next question. I mean, do you have a lot of free reign with it? I mean, you could do almost anything, bring in uh, new concepts within reason, right? Uh, so, yes. Yeah, okay. So there's nobody there dictating. It's like, Dick Tracy wouldn't do that. You can't do that or whatever. <laughs> yeah. We have an editor, and we need an editor because there are certain rules with uh, daily comics that we – that Joe and I don't necessarily know because we're we're comic book background, right? You know? mm -hmm. Well, have you had any problems with censorship in the last few years, or anything that's like tone it down or mm, don't do that for a family newspaper or something like that? Our first week, we had I had a character saying, "Oh my God," and then found out we couldn't do. It. <laughs> so see, we need, we need an editor. Yeah. Specifically for these things to to know what we can and cannot do. Mm-hmm. And let's see. Um, and then uh, you know, IDW, through their Library of American Comics, they've been reprinting the books, and I believe they're up to, finally up to the early 70s here, so they're almost to the end of the run. I think volume 26 uh, for 1971, 1972 comes out in June of this year, 2019. Um, are you working in conjunction with those, or are you just probably just collecting those books? We get copies. Okay. But do you offer any sort of suggestion or anything on that, or is it just totally independent of what you're working on? It's totally independent, totally different project. Got it. Okay. And uh, do you foresee a time where they may start uh, reprinting uh, your strips with Joe, you know, as uh, book collections and, and such? Well, that, uh, if they're going uh, in consecutive order, they'd have quite a few years before we I don't imagine we would be around to see them if they continue doing it. Right. Well, that's assuming they do all the intervening years. But, I mean, uh, would they ever just jump the gun and just go straight to your years just because you're currently producing the strip? I wish. We would like to have our stuff in print, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Or even with another publisher. I mean, it's like, do you have any say-so over that or no? <laughs> no, that's, a, that's up to the Tribune because they own the character. Oh, okay. Because... 
I think it'd be nice if you could at least get like a best of out of the years you've done the strip so far, especially if it's coming up, you know, in a couple years to 10 years, you know, that'd be a nice <laughs> anniversary gift of the 90th anniversary of the strip, you know, but <laughs> well, that's one reason Joe and I do the free comic books that are given away at conventions. Mm-hmm. So that basically we have an example of our, our work that someone that likes it, if they're at a convention with us, can come up and see us and we can sign something for them. Mm-hmm. And how is how is how are people how, how's the reception when uh, they see you at shows? What do they talk about? Uh, most mostly uh, that they're they're very glad we took over the strip. They they follow it daily, and uh, we're we're very happy about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, now one thing that we have gotten a lot of feedback on is crossovers, and I wanted to make sure to get that in this interview. Okay. That we do crossovers. Mm-hmm. This is a comic book concept primarily, and we brought it into Tracy, where that it's not unusual at all for Dick Tracy to show up in somebody else's strip or for somebody else's strip characters to show up in Dick Tracy. Hmm. Uh, this this past year we did a uh, elaborate adventure with the spirit, Will Eisner's spirit, right, and that's, that's the right. one that's being reprinted right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the course of the spirit adventure, other characters that were in there were Daddy Warbucks from the Lord of Annie, <laughs> uh, the Dragon Lady from Terry and the Pirates, and uh, you know it's just it, it's fun to do crossovers. We had uh, Dick Tracy not team up with, but uh, rather combat the Green Hornets this past year. Mm. <laughs> and we uh, since little little Lord of Annie ended on a cliffhanger. We decided to give her a, a resolution to her adventure, so we had her last adventure in Dick Tracy. Wow! <laughs> so that was fun. Mm-hmm. Didn't you have uh, Fearless Fosdick from Little Abner make an appearance? I think I read that somewhere. Yep, we did. It was a dream sequence, and it's reprinted in the Spirit Book as well. Okay. <laughs> and that yeah. book is free at, at our convention appearances. Ah. Doesn't cost a penny. And. You know, since you mentioned convention appearances, where where are you planning to go in the next few months? Uh, I don't have anything booked for a while myself. Oh, okay. Uh, Joe is going to be in Chicago the end of March. Okay. And he will have the new spirit book there. Okay. At the time. And where have you appeared in the past? Then, if you're not uh, planning anything at the moment. Uh, Baltimore, uh, Memphis, uh, Akron. Okay. Okay. Any chances in the future of maybe going back to the, any of those places or new places? Oh, possibly so. It, it, it all depends. Okay. All right. And um, on all those cameo appearances in the strip and everything, or even putting, it, you said Dick Tracy has appeared in other strips. What other strips has, has he appeared in? Duffy Smith, oddly enough. <laughs> now, do you we did a cross- go ahead? We had we had the characters from Snuffy. In, on a Sunday in uh, Dick Tracy, and then there were two dailies where he was in Snuffy Smith. Mm-hmm. He's been in Gasoline Alley, mm-hmm. and uh, we, we are all, always talking with other other cr- creators. Now, one other thing we've also done is we're uh, is that Gould did is having live celebrities in Tracy. Mm. Uh, the first one we did was Jerry Lawler, the, you know, from WWE. Mm-hmm. He's been in the strip a couple of times. <laughs> And uh, we've talked to, we've had a few others, and uh, we've, Sven Gooey was in uh, Dick Tracy for a while. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, do you get permission uh, from all these people? How, how do you go about it? Or do you just put the character in and just hope for the best? Or is no, this... no, no, we contact them. Ah. We contact them and ask their permission mm-hmm. and give them uh, give them veto over what the characters say and such. Ah, Okay. And then the ones that appear in your strip, again, I, I think I asked this earlier, and you, I think you answered it. So Joe would draw the cameo appearances by, say, Little Orphan Annie or whatever. It wouldn't be a, a, an additional artist doing it or anything like that? We had one, uh, The only time we've had an additional artist doing it was when Mike Patterson from For, For Better or Worse showed up. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lynn Johnston wanted to draw him, so she basically drew three panels of the strip. Oh, wow. Okay. Because, yeah, I've seen mashups like that where there's a different artist. Even in Peanuts, you know, it's like uh, Bill Malden uh, was in one strip, you know, with Snoopy. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh-huh. so um, 
Anyway, um, let's see. So you haven't mentioned Shanda yet. Go ahead. You haven't mentioned Shanda yet. Uh, what should I mention about Shanda? Is is Shanda in the? Uh, is, is been in, in Dick Tracy? <laughs> oh no, but uh, Shanda's last issue just came out. Right. Yeah. Uh, issue fifty, which uh, concludes the series. Yes. And it just. Came mm-hmm. <laughs> And I'll talk a little bit about Chanda. Uh, so, where did that character come from? I think you told me in a previous interview, but you know, go ahead again. You know, and how did that come about? Well, I, I ran movie theaters for eleven years, mm-hmm. so basically, I came up with a comic book about a theater manager. Right. And it's it's a furry comic book, mm-hmm. uh, anthropomorphic. So she's a panda. And uh, the way the, when people ask about it, what it what it's like or what it's about, I said. Well, she's a panda, her her boyfriend is a Cajun raccoon, and her best friend is a lesbian cricket. (laughs) And that gives them an idea of of what what it's like. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And has the character evolved over the years, or how has it happened, you know, over the 50 issues? Has there been like a major story arc or anything? I mean, I have a few issues, of course, but... uh... Yes, she evolved a lot. I mean, she, it was a long, basically a, about four or five years of her life kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And but, uh, basically, in the fir- in the first issue, she uh, she met uh, uh, Double R, who's the Cajun raccoon, and uh, they're getting married in issue fifty. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it does have some sort of sense of closure. Is there a reason why ending it now, or? Uh, just because it's a nice even number round number 50 or well I'd always uh, I always had 50 uh, scripts for uh, Shanda and I'm ending it now because basically uh, I haven't been able to do Shanda for the last 4 or 5 years due to working on Dick Tracy that takes up all my time Right. but I wanted to do Shanda a conclusion so many independent series never, they never have a conclusion okay Cause and I promised her I'd get her married, so she's married now. Okay, because <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. I, 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 you know, I always just assumed that when you started doing Dick Tracy, he, uh, that was the end of the Shanda series. Because you said you hadn't done one in about five years at least. So yeah, and also part of it is, uh, you know, Diamond doesn't carry as many independents as it used to, and uh, that's true. It's it's just not a it's not a go- uh, going concern. Mm-hmm. You know, publishing comic books, but for us anyway. Right. Other people, yes, but uh, we. Uh, the days of us being independent comic book publishers are over. We're right. just working right. on Dick Tracy now. Yeah. Well, that's like me with my fanzines. <laughs> I had to discontinue that and go into writing books for precisely the same reason. So. Well, uh, one thing I do want to put in this interview. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anybody's ever noticed it, but I'm going to point it out. There's one th- there's one word you will never see in Dick Tracy and has never been in it since I took over the strip. Which is? Meanwhile. Meanwhile. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too much, so I don't use it at all. <laughs> Do it in your last strip. The last strip will be called Meanwhile. No, if you, <laughs> hopefully that's far off into the future. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, well, uh Any final thoughts about Dick Tracy today, you know, for the upcoming 90th anniversary? Anything planned by the the syndicate or anything? Well, uh, here's what. I'll I'll tell a story about Dick Tracy. Okay. When I was, and this will work work for a wrap-up. When I was a little kid, my parents moved from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Tennessee. My dad was going to be running the Wonder Bread Depot. My mother was going to be working there. My brother was in school. I wasn't in school yet, so they had a kid, a six-year-old kid on their hands for about 12 hours a day. So what did they do with the kid to keep him occupied? Well, the smart thing was they gave me a comic book. Mm -hmm. I started reading Dick Tracy and those giant Harvey comic books that came out in the late 50s, Mm -hmm. early 60s. The first one I read was uh, Measles is a Teenage Dope Fiend. (laughs) And uh, in it, uh, during the course of the story, Dick Tracy gets himself caught to the back of a car somehow, and he's dragged to his death on the behind a car until he rescues himself. Hmm. Anyway, the next month, when the new Dick Tracy comic book came out, it was Wormy. Now, Measles was a reprint from 43. Wormy was a reprint from 49. And in 1949, Dick Tracy chases Wormy, gets caught on the back of his car, and starts getting dragged to death by... 
car. <laughs> so then, anyway, shortly after that, uh, we had uh, gotten settled, and I was reading Dick Tracy in the newspapers, and my mother asked me how I liked it, and I said, yeah, I like it fine, but when's he going to get dragged behind a car? Because <laughs> I thought that was part of every Tracy adventure. <laughs> so I made a promise when we won a Harvey that, that it hadn't happened yet, but before we fin- finished our run on Dick Tracy, we would drag him to death behind a car, and we did it last year. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I don't know if that's what Dick Tracy's best known for, but that's actually a pretty funny story. So <laughs> um, let's see. I figured that would be a good one to go out with. Yes. Um, so um, I guess, you know, this is the general plug time at the end of the show. So uh, if people want to get copies of... Uh, Issue 50 or any issue of Shanda, I assume you have back issues and stuff. How do, how do they get a hold of you uh, to get issues? Well, they can also get uh, the, the Dick Tracy giveaway comics from uh, from me, except on the giveaway comics, I basically just charge $2, and that takes care of the postage and the handling. Got it. Mm-hmm. Because the comic book is free. Mm-hmm. But uh, basically... Uh, website anymore <laughs> for Shan. Hmm. M&D Comics handles uh, Shanda nowadays, and uh, they can get them from them. Okay. But, I mean, could they email you or something and just say, hey, I'm interested, See, and then you could work out a deal or something? I, uh, Shanda Fa, S-H-A-N-D-A-F, as in Frank, A, at windstream.net. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I can, I can send somebody a copy of Shanda or a copy of... Uh, the new Dick Tracy book when it comes out in about a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Okay. And then uh, you said uh, Joe is going to be appearing in Chicago. When is that again? Uh, I think it's March 22nd, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I'll try to get when this. You talk to, when you talk to Joe, uh, uh, if you're going to do a podcast with him, he'll have better information. Okay. I'll try to get this show up before then. So, <laughs> And okay. uh, let's see. Um and any other things you'd like to plug, uh, past, present, future? <laughs> I'm working on a project, but I can't plug it. Okay. It's secret. Okay. And is there any other things uh, that they can order from you besides the Dick Tracy or the current Shanda? That's about it, really. Okay. And uh, let's see. Um, any last thoughts about Dick Tracy or your career or anything else you'd like to say? Yes. It takes drive. You have to keep trying. I talked to somebody one time that had had two breaks with the, the majors, and uh, things had gotten not gone well, so it, uh, he didn't stay with the majors. And he said, and he told me on the phone, he said, but I'm ready when they knock on your, my door. And I was thinking, they're never going to knock on your door. You have to go knock on their door. Okay. If you want to work in comics, you have to be the one to... They're never going to discover you. You have to go out and push yourself. That's true. I know that Joe for a fact. I would not be doing Tracy otherwise. Mm-hmm. So that, 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 is a, that is a piece of advice I would like to give to people. Okay. And uh, just, uh, I guess that leads to one last question, but, you know, it's like how does it feel for you uh, to actually fulfill a dream like that of uh, writing for major uh syndicated strip Dick Tracy it's wonderful All many right. people a lot of times people have told me I live live the dream yeah yeah I think you have so <laughs> thank you for listening and thank you again Mike Curtis for being my special guest episode number 26 will be coming soon if you'd like to comment and or be a guest on this podcast please drop me a line at funideas.mark at gmail.com become a patron of Fun Ideas Productions, and if everyone listening just contributed $1 a month, that would be a tremendous help. This has been the Fun Ideas Podcast. This is Mark Arnold speaking. This episode is copyright 2019, Fun Ideas Productions. Thank you very much, and have a good night.